Good morning and welcome to St. Andrew's Wesley on this Sunday in the season of Christmas. And as different as our Christmas has been this year due to pandemic restrictions that are necessary but difficult, uh, we, we remember that we're still connected to each other. Uh, even when we can't be physically together in the same room, at least we can be connected this way and more significantly we're connected as a community, as, a, as the body of Christ. We're connected in the spirit of God, one to another. And so welcome here once again to St. Andrew's Wesley, where uh, we are a group of people that come together, open-minded folks, uh, open-hearted, LGBTQ affirming, and all of us in our own way and together seek to follow in the way of Jesus, to further the work of justice and peace in the world. It's a way of seeing each other holding each other up, honoring each other. In the Honkaminam uh, language of the Squamish people, uh, that, the word for that is chen chen sui. It means to lift up and to honor, to recognize, to see. And that's what our reconciliation work is about here at St. Andrew's Wesley, and I think as a, as a country, really, to recognize and see each other, to make time for each other, make room for each other, chen chen sui to lift up and to honor. And so that's why at the beginning of every service, we recognize that we gather here at St. Andrew's Wesley on the traditional and unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh. And we're glad, glad and honored to be part of this ongoing work. Christmas is, of course, a time when we celebrate the birth of Jesus and uh, significantly uh, recognize the light that shines in the shadows of the world. And uh, so, at the beginning of this service, we go to Bowen Island where Tim and Donna Scorer light the Christ candle as we celebrate the light that calls us together as one. We come now remembering the one in whom the light of hope, peace, joy, and love shines bright. We come now to light the Christ candle, even as we acknowledge the birth of the Christ child. Under these spangled skies, held fast to this holy home, you open us to our innocence, our neighborliness with you. We reach out for this glow of graced presence, this warm blessing of your hands. In humility, we kneel, light burst, and our hearts hold the wonder of it all with you. And we pray, O living one, let your spirit shine in our hearts. Let your love shine in the world. And let the wonder of this night touch all of our hearts as the Christ child invites us into infinite, undying love. And let the wonder of this night touch all our hearts as the Christ child invites us into infinite, undying love. Amen. Amen. In the beginning, before time, before people, before the world began, God was. Here and now among us, beside us, enlisting the people of earth for the purposes of heaven, God is. In the future, when we have turned to dust and all we know has found its fulfillment, God will be. Not denying the world, but delighting in it. Not understanding the world, but redeeming it. Through Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit. God was. God is. God will be. Let us prepare our hearts for worship. <laughs> Oh, oh, oh. 
quite different this year, not what we expected or hoped for, but I pray that this time is still filled with much hope, peace, joy, and love. I don't know about you, but I, I am rather impatient. I find waiting really hard. And there were many, many at Christmases when my parents were awoken in the middle of the night by my brother and I asking the question, is it time yet? Only to be sent back to our rooms to wait. And then there were the times that the waiting also included the hoping of a specific toy to arrive underneath the tree, like the Bionic Woman action figure. But oftentimes it didn't. Something else was there to surprise us. You know, waiting can be hard and we have done a lot of waiting this year. Waiting for a vaccine, waiting for schools to reopen, waiting to play with friends and have them over for supper, waiting to go on a trip, waiting to see family or to hug family waiting to heal or waiting for someone to feel better. I wonder what you have been waiting for. When I find waiting hard, I will often take time to simply breathe. I'll also take time to pray and talk to God. And when waiting is really, really hard, I will open my Bible and remind myself of the stories of people who followed God and loved God that also had to wait for something to change in their life, for someone to come to teach and lead them that they so longed for. And I'm reminded each time as I dive into those stories that some of these people waited a lifetime. They waited long, long times, but in their waiting, they learned to trust God, to trust God's love. And this morning, we are going to hear a story from our Bibles about Anna and Simeon, two people who waited a long time for someone to come. 
But before we do, will you pray with me? God, we thank you that you are with us in our waiting and in our hoping, especially when the waiting is hard and feels impossible. We thank you for the stories of our faith that remind us of your love. Amen. Today we hear the story of Mary and Joseph going to the temple in Jerusalem to present their baby Jesus. A rite that marks Jesus as Jewish and firmly located within the people with whom God has kept covenant for hundreds of years. Mary and Joseph are devout Jews and they take the law and the temple very seriously. They go to the temple every year as they travel from Nazareth to Galilee. And this year, of course, is different as they have their baby Jesus in their arms. And while others might bring a lamb to sacrifice, they bring two turtle doves as an offering, offering because they're poor and this is all they can muster. And it's very important to them to observe the law. So hand in hand with the story of Jesus being presented at the temple is the introduction of two characters who do not ordinarily get a lot of airtime at Christmas, Simeon and Anna, two elders at the temple who most likely would never be featured on a Christmas card. They are not as famous as the shepherds or the angels or the wise men, but you will hear that Anna is most likely the first evangelist and Simeon is a very old man living to meet the Messiah before he can die. And as this is a Celtic service, and Celtic Christianity pays particular attention to the liminal places, the thin spaces, places where the holy draws very near, imagine the physical space of the temple, the journey Mary and Joseph have just taken, and put yourself in those places as the story begins. When the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and his sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. My friend Lynn sent me a comic this morning, and uh, it was a picture of the manger 
and the uh, wise men and the shepherds and the animals. And all of a sudden in the next frame, Joseph comes screaming out of the manger. And he says, it's a girl. Not what we were expecting. It's about our expectations at this point. When we are moving from an old year, a very old year, to a new year, and what are we expecting to hold on to? What are we expecting to leave behind? And no matter what we expect, it's going to be different than what we expect. A couple of years ago, as many of you know, I went to Guatemala with um, Doris Kazina and her partner Julio and Dan and a busload of wonderful people from our church. And I looked forward to the trip for a long time. I'd never been to Guatemala or anywhere near it. I expected to see beauty and to meet wonderful people, to experience a new culture and a new spirituality as we learned about the Mayan people. I didn't expect to have my life altered, my heart reshaped, my vision of the world shifted. What I expected, mostly as a result of reading, hearing stories, and watching documentaries, did not come close to what I actually experienced. The trip we took to Guatemala placed a lasting and deep imprint on my spirit and on my psyche. I could dream about it all I wanted before I went, how it actually turned out, and what the experience actually was could never have been predicted. And so through Advent, we were asked to stay awake, to be alert, to watch and wait for the coming of the light, the darkness, and baby Jesus. And now Christmas Day has passed, so whatever we were looking forward to or dreading, expecting, anticipating, all of that has happened. We made it through, the, we made it through this one, this one-off, very strange and unfamiliar way of celebrating Christmas. And life goes on. We pick ourselves up and dust ourselves off, and our stories and our lives continue. So what were you expecting Christmas to be? We didn't have any signposts because we've never done a COVID Christmas before. This Christmas, as different as it was, had some similarities to Christmas's past. That's because we have expectations. And we had ideas around the outcomes. We were looking for something to happen that we had already designed in our minds and hearts. And did that actually happen? Did what we had manufactured in our heads and our hearts, did that actually take place? Or was it different than any script we could have previously written? God is like that, full of surprises and beginnings and endings that we could never have predicted nor expected. And I don't know about you, but the things that I picture in my heart and that I picture in my head and in my imagination, things that are going to happen, rarely do happen the way I imagine them to be. So when Mary and Joseph, a young Jewish couple, began their journey from Nazareth to Jerusalem, baby Jesus in their arms, two turtle doves ready to be sacrificed, could they ever have anticipated what lay ahead of them? Jerusalem is about 147 kilometers from Nazareth, and that's a long journey, especially on foot. Mary and Joseph, as devout Jews, made this trek every year, so they knew where they were going and they knew how to get there. But they didn't know about the people that they would meet. They didn't know the impact that their son would have on the two elders waiting for them in the temple. What was about to happen to them most likely exceeded their expectations. Now, our service today has a Celtic flavor to it. Celtic Christianity places a strong emphasis on the spirit world, the unseen beings who accompany us, 
the natural world and its mystical powers. As they made their way to Jerusalem, I wonder how Mary and Joseph experienced the presence of the holy. How they responded to the natural world. What prayers they prayed as they traveled along in the night and in the day. And when they finally entered the temple, a luminal and thin place, they first meet Simeon. Simeon is a very old man. He's probably somewhere between 87 and 90. And he has prayed and prayed all his life to meet the Messiah. He's visited the temple for years, maintaining that until he meets the Messiah, he will not and he cannot die. So Simeon rejoices when he sees the baby Jesus because he recognizes him as the long-awaited consolation of Israel. God has fulfilled God's promise to free the people from exile. Simeon connects us to the past. And Simeon's not alone in the temple, although he's just come that day to visit, and he comes often. Anna is also in the temple. Anna is another elder, 85, 86, 87 years old, and she never leaves the temple. She silently holds the space and she silently waits, and she prays, and she fasts, and she is in her own thin place, waiting for the Messiah. She's a prophetess, waiting against many odds, living in the temple silently and courageously. So what could a life like Anna's have felt like? She would have had to be courageous and resilient and patient she would have lived with a deep longing for her prayers to be answered. She would have had to be faithful and trusting. She would have had a profound sense of the holy as she held her silence in the temple, year after year waiting for the Messiah. What did Anna see? And what did Anna imagine? And again, looking through the lens of Celtic Christianity, we can put the emphasis on the felt but unseen. Celtic spirituality is marked by the belief that what is deepest in us is the image of God. Anna must have felt that image of God embedded in her. What else could have kept her still, silently waiting for the Messiah to come to her? And Celtic Christians had a reverence for creation, believing the natural world was an expression of God. So just imagining the Celtic Christian lens for Anna again, the world around her, the smells of the temple, the breezes that would come through, the space, the dust, the wind, the ground, the trees, and roots, they might all have been invitations and accompaniments to Anna as she waited. Anna was a witnessing presence, the presence of the holy and the sacred was where her life was centered. She prayed without ceasing, and she waited. In that place of transition, she waited in that moment in time, caught between then and now, the past and the not yet. And I don't believe that Anna felt uncomfortable here. She trusted, and she was patient, and she was courageous, and she was silent. Until she met Jesus, finally. And then she began to talk to whoever would listen about Jesus and about the redemption of Jerusalem, she really was the first evangelist, connecting people to the future, telling them that all would be well. And Simeon waited too. There was a tangible expectancy in the first century for the coming of the Messiah. People were desperate for God to intervene, and they were willing to wait. Simeon was one of them. So while Anna connected the people to the future, Simeon linked them to the past and to God's promise of freedom to Israel. And Anna, as a prophet, pointed to the future as the world's savior had finally arrived. But the surprise, the Messiah did not come as a man or as a youth or as anything either Anna or Simeon could have expected. He came as a baby. 
And when he arrives, Simeon takes the baby in his arms and joyfully proclaims, For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to the people of Israel. Simeon sees God's promise to Israel fulfilled, and he can die a peaceful man. So this is what he has been expecting, but he could not have predicted the depths of his joy as he held that tiny baby. And there's one other piece of Simeon's rule that we need to unpack. Imagine your parents to a a brand new baby, and you're filled with joy as you bring your baby to be baptized, bring your baby to the church. And some very elderly man comes up to you that you don't know, someone you've never seen before, and takes your baby out of your arms into his arms. And although he appears joyful, he also has a warning. And this man says that, This little baby was going to change the world, but was also going to bring on heartache. And he will be the rise, he'll be the cause of the rise and fall of many. And Simeon is not talking about war or destruction, something the Jews know much about. He's talking about the personal rise and fall of people's lives as they become transparent and their inner thoughts are revealed. So after this proclamation, Simeon hands the baby back to Mary. Quite an event for Mary to process. When we add it all up, and as much as we try to live and be in the moment, much of our lives are spent waiting. We spend a lot of time expecting, and expectation has a relative. It's called disappointment because things don't always turn out as we expect them to. But still we wait for practical things like buses and ferries, and we wait for babies to be born. We wait for healing to come to us when we're broken and saddened. We wait for understanding when we feel misunderstood. We wait for clarity to come when we are confused or discouraged. We wait for justice to arrive as may, as, as uh, our indigenous siblings still don't have potable water in their communities. We wait for our turn for the vaccine to take away some of our fear and perhaps restore us to a life that we long for. We wait for death to come when a life needs to end. So we have expectations now, and New Year is just a few days away. At this point, after the year we have just lived, we expect things to improve at least a little. We wait for a new year. We wait for the turning of the year. And we wait for God, and as the Celts did, we may wait to find God in the forest, in the sea, in the crashing of the waves. And we practice deep listening so that we can hear the heartbeat of God in one another and in the natural world. We wait to express acts of love for the life of the world. And Psalm 130 says, I wait for you, O God. My soul waits, and in your word I hope. My soul waits for you, O God, more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. And so we are still waiting. As we live in a world where God meets us and we work together to bring about God's design, to create God's delight, to work with our God to bring healing and compassion and beauty and more. And we wait for God with great expectation and great longing. May it be so. Amen. So
Thank you, Benila and Shane and friends. The uh, sounds of Christmas bring us into a reflective moment of prayer. So I invite you to be in an attitude of prayer. Holy One, this Christmas Sunday we pause. We rest in you as a sparrow finds a perch on the limb of a safe tree. With Simeon and Anna, we sit and pray, we pray and sit, sometimes resting our head in the padded temple of our hands. And in the waiting and the watching, the praying and the resting, we sometimes wonder, will the day come? Will the day come when we can be together again with friends and family and community when we can sing together again and greet with a hug, a handshake? Will the day come when frontline workers don't need to worry about the air they breathe? Will the day come when a person of color doesn't have to think twice about their shade of skin because the playing field has been finally leveled? Will the day come when women say, Me too, And they're referring to their seat at the corporate or political or academic table. Will the day come when conversion therapy is banned and someone in the LGBTQ plus community doesn't have to unlearn oppression? Will the day come when enough people ask, 
what's possible instead of how much can we profit? Will the day come when people of different faith and uh, political beliefs and different languages and ways of being can look at each other and see across the differences a sibling, a relation, a potential friend? With Anna and Simeon, we sit and pray and wait and hope. Help us do our part, you persuasive God. But also remember, help us remember that it is your kingdom to come, not our Tower of Babel to build. And so we pray for the hurting, the lonely, the ostracized and marginalized. We pray for victims of war, violence and abuse. And, O oh God, we pray for healing to mend broken hearts and the ones that are hurt may find their way again to love. May the spirit of Christmas come to us, land in us, rest in us that we too rise with wonder and joy and live peace and sing boldly of the grace of God. And so with Christians gathered to celebrate a birth of one who embodied radical love and brings light to our hearts. We offer the prayer of our tradition, our mother, our father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. There is so much we can offer the world. Kindness, intelligence, integrity, honesty, money, a helping hand, laughter, compassion, love. St. Andrews Wesley strives to be a light in the heart of the city and do what we can to brighten the shadows, not only at Christmas, but all year round. So if you're able to make a contribution that helps support our ministries of outreach and service and our very presence here on the corner of Burrard and Nelson, we would be so grateful. There are a number of ways listed that, uh, uh, where you can contribute. Uh, send a check to the church office or uh, use the QR code or uh, push pay, um, uh, however, however your donation comes and whatever amount it is in. We're very grateful and it all makes a difference. Your donation also helps us make a difference uh, in this small patch of Vancouver, but also well beyond. So I'd like to invite us to listen now to Karen Efron as she talks about her involvement with the Women's Wisdom Circle, a group of people who do what they can to further the light of Christ in the world together. My name is Karen Efron. I first joined St. Andrews Wesley in 1998. I came to the church because it was highly recommended by a source that I trusted, and I was promised good music and good preaching, which I certainly did find. I knew as soon as I heard Daryl playing and directing the choir that I wanted to stay there. In terms of the Women's Wisdom Group, I joined that right from the start. And uh, uh, from the beginning, I knew I would do whatever it took to get there. It was quite a long drive for me. Uh, but when I got there, there was a relaxing, loving atmosphere where you could express yourself and you knew you, you would be accepted and you'd never be judged. In addition to that, Lorraine gave us interesting, stimulating topics and provided wonderful, soothing music and prayer and just became the most important thing to me every week to really look forward to. And then when I moved in March back to Ontario, I was fortunately able to continue uh, virtually. I learned Zoom and um, I look forward to it happening uh, twice a month. And I've been able to join other things on Zoom as well. It keeps me feeling connected during these challenging times. 
So if you're interested in joining a, a supportive group that will nurture your spiritual journey, maybe Women's Wisdom is for you. And it meets on Thursdays on the first and third Thursday of the month at 2 o'clock Pacific time. Thank you very much. So, my friends, December 27th, a few more days till we turn the page and we enter a new year. And there are great expectations around that. And as we wait, I pray for you an old Celtic blessing, deep peace of the running wave to you, deep peace of the flowing air to you, Deep peace of the quiet earth to you. Deep peace of the shining stars to you. Deep peace of the sun of peace to you. May it be so. Amen.